Welcome to NFP Office Hours. I'm your host, Teresa Notare. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heart of Jesus, burning furnace of love, inflame our hearts for love of you and our neighbors. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may be animated by his love and give glory to God the Father in our lives, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Today, we're going to be talking about marriage ministry and natural family planning ministry and how the two intersect by looking at the Holy See's document, the Marriage Catechumenate Pathways. And to help us do that is our guest, Richard Budd, who is the Director of Marriage and Family Life for the Diocese of Lansing in Michigan. Now, Richard obtained his master's degree in theology from the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for studies on marriage and family in Washington, D.C. His writings have appeared in publications such as Humanum, Issues in Family, Culture, and Science, Adoremus Bulletin, and he's also a regular contributor to the publication Faith. Nationally, Richard has also served on the Executive Committee for the Catholic Family Life Association, and he has contributed and helped us at the Bishop's Conference on various projects having to do with marriage and family ministry. In his role as Director of Marriage Ministry, Richard developed the Diocese of Lansing's Marriage Catechumenate in 2017. After a thorough testing and piloting process, it has become the standard for their marriage preparation. Now, Richard and his wife and five children, as if all that he's done isn't enough, he and his wife and five children have a, a beautiful family life in the Diocese of Lansing. And uh, I'm so glad, Richard, that given how busy you are, you're taking the time to be with us today. My pleasure. If you'd like, you could share your screen. Um, sure. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to be able to uh, to spend some time with uh, those of you watching the, um, this presentation today. Uh, the marriage catechumenate uh, has been something that has been very uh, uh, close to my heart. From the beginning of my ministry and family life, uh, it was one of the first things uh, when I was hired as a diocesan director. Um, our bishop, Bishop Earl Boyer, asked me to make our marriage preparation processes form disciples. Uh, evangelization is a is a um, big concern for him, and he recognized the fact that um, so much of the faith gets passed on in the family. And uh, as we'll 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 mention um, in the presentation today, uh, this has been a message that has been consistently uh, uh, shared by our popes now for decades. And so we need to be heeding uh, what those uh, leaders of our faith are are asking us to um, to pay attention to, right? And so uh, John Paul II, way back forty two years ago. Um, began calling for an approach to marriage preparation that imitated the baptismal catechumenate, otherwise known as RCIA, or now uh, the name has been changed to OCIA for the Order of Christian Initiation for Adults. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the background of how that came to be. Uh, um, oh, I, for, I, I I skipped through my uh, one thought into another thought. Uh, this calling for uh, this this approach has been decades in the making, but it was just recently in um, uh, 2022 uh, that the Vatican actually published a document to encourage us to begin to approach marriage preparation as a catechumenate in, in, in imitation of the RCIA process. And so we'll talk about some background of how we got up to that. I'll lead us through some highlights of that document. It's a long document. Um, it's about 100 pages or so, uh, but we'll just hit some highlights. Uh, I'll talk about how we implemented this in the Diocese of Lansing or how we're continuing to implement it because we actually were a little bit ahead of the Vatican on this. Uh, we we began implementing ours um, in uh, 2017. And then, um, and then I'll offer some important considerations for those of you who work in fertility ministries and um, might not be involved in the whole process, but how does your particular ministry fit into uh, this overall vision of the church uh, for marriage preparation? 
So diving in with the background, uh, Vatican Council II said that the well-being of the individual person and of the human and Christian society is intimately linked with the healthy condition of that community produced by marriage and the family. So right from the council, we hear the importance um, for not only the individual, but for society in general, that the family has to be healthy. No surprise, I know. Uh, Pope John Paul II, in a very famous quote, says, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. And uh, again, from Vatican Council II, the Christian family, which springs from marriage as a reflection of the loving covenant uniting Christ with the church, and as a participation in that covenant, will manifest to all men Christ's living presence in the world and the genuine nature of the church. And so the family has this particular task of reflecting uh, that covenant between Christ and the church. It's not just a, an add-on. God designed the Christian family to be a sacramental uh, revelation of his love for the church. Pope Benedict the six, the sixteenth, the new evangelization depends largely on the, the on the domestic church. Uh, we all know that evangelization has been a big theme of our leaders, our popes, and our bishops over the last few decades. Um, but what Pope Benedict the sixteenth pointed out is if that we're really going to have a true new evangelization, we have to give attention to the domestic church. And then Pope Francis. They do not understand it is for life. They do not understand the sacrament. They have a different culture. So Pope Francis in his typical, very charismatic way of preaching is calling us very emphatically to pay attention that the culture that we're trying to reach out to uh, is, is very much at odds with the gospel. And so what do couples often lack when they come into marriage preparation? I'm sure uh, the couples that you work with in, in uh, training for natural family planning, you see this all the time. But to summarize, they don't have contact with a, sacram a regular sacramental life. They don't have a consistent prayer life. Uh, they don't even have a baseline catechesis. They don't have a real sense of the Catholic Christian community. Um, they don't have good examples of marital fidelity in their families. How often uh, do people come to the sacrament of matrimony uh, and in their history are, is divorce and abandonment, not only in their own parents, but maybe in their grandparents, their aunts and uncles, et cetera. Um, and in particular, over the last couple of decades, there's less and less stability in the terms of where people live and work. Uh, we're becoming a very fluctuating society, people moving all over. Um, and so uh, these are one of the challenges that we have to train couples for the sacrament of matrimony is often they're not even in the same uh, state, let alone the same town. And so how can we be flexible in ways to help uh, help a very mobile society prepare in meaningful ways? Uh, but all that being said, nothing's more damaging uh, than the lack of an actual belief and the relationship in Jesus Christ. And so this is one of the most um, uh, important uh, things that we have to share at any time uh, an individual comes into contact with the church is the message and, and the person of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, you know, marriage has this very, has, as its inherent logic, it's a fruitful gift of self. That's what marriage is by its very nature. Um, and it's an inherently Christian way of life. God made marriage with the end in mind that it would be an image of uh, God the Son's love for the church. And so if you're unbaptized or atheist or pagan, like that's still the nature of marriage. That's what God originally created it for, is so that it could become the sacrament of his relationship with the church. Um, marriage is a reality that really contradicts in many ways, the more fundamental issues of our current culture, uh, that being, uh, radical individualism, personal freedom as the highest value, uh, et cetera. Um, but the sacrament of matrimony, as, as, as we've mentioned, is about revealing Jesus Christ. And so people that we're training for marriage need to be able to come in contact with him if they're going to be effective uh, sacraments of his uh, his love for the church. If they're going to be revealing him in an effective way, they have to know him. 
we can't expect people to be able to reveal Christ if they don't even know him. And so this really begs the question, what is the quality of our marriage preparation? Are we preparing couples to live what the sacrament is, or are we just passing on simple life skills, communication, conflict resolution, all good things? Uh, but the nature of the sacrament is a little bit more. And so are we preparing them for that little bit more? So um, as we are moving towards this document, uh, just some some uh, foundational uh, ideas. Um, one comes from the General Directory for Catechesis. It says that the model for all catechesis, and we would include marriage preparation in that, it's, it's the prenuptial catechesis. The model for all catechesis is the baptismal catechumenate in both their objectives and their dynamism. And so the every time we engage in catechesis, we're trying to teach the faith, we have the baptismal catechumenate, which is the RCIA, as our model for how we're supposed to go about it, um, not only in the goal, you know, to have a relationship with God, but also in the 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 the, the methods and the the impact that it's supposed to have on their lives. John Paul II, uh, in Familiaris Consortio, uh, says that among the elements to be instilled in marriage preparation, which is similar to the catechumenate, there must also be a deeper knowledge of the mystery of Christ in the church, of the meaning of grace, and of the responsibility of Christian marriage, as well as preparation for taking an active and conscious part in the rites of the marriage litur liturgy. So just to break that down a little bit, uh, do, do, do our marriage preparation programs actually put people in touch with the mystery of Jesus? Do they actually encounter him? You know, and I think for so long we were concerned about the human elements of marriage preparation that we forgot that the primary purpose of the sacrament was a relationship with Christ. And so John Paul II, way back in 1981, is calling us to remember this, right? And so uh, he wants us to, uh, again, have a deeper understanding of the meaning of grace, the responsibilities that come with Christian marriage, and then how to be able to take an active and conscious part in the in the marriage liturgy. And that's one of the things that we really took um, uh, as uh, an important part of our marriage preparation process was that you would never expect a priest to celebrate the mass having never looked at the rite, you know, the big missile. So, but we expect our couples to do that all the time. They're the ministers of the sacrament of matrimony, but oftentimes they've hardly looked at the rite at all. And so we want to be able to spend a little, at least a little bit of time with them to be able to look at the right, to understand it, know what they're actually saying, what they're doing. Um, from uh, Pope Francis's beautiful document, Amoris Laetitia, uh, he says, the complex social reality and the challenges today's family of today's family is called to confront require a greater commitment from the entire Christian community for the preparation of the engaged for matrimony. In this regard, the Synod Fathers agreed on the need to involve the entire community more extensively by stressing the willingness of families themselves and by grounding marriage preparation in the process of Christian initiation. They do not need to be taught the entire catechism or, overwhelmed, or be overwhelmed with too much information. Quality is more important than quantity, and priority should be given along with a renewed proclamation of the kerygma to an attractive and helpful presentation of information that can help couples to live the rest of their lives together with great courage and generosity. So I just want to hone in a little bit on that last quote. A lot of times we think that to prepare people well, we have to give them every single thing that we know about marriage. And uh, that's they have their whole lives to learn everything that there is to know about marriage. They need to be able to find their spot in the Christian community, to find their relationship with Christ, and to begin this apprenticeship in marriage. If we think of marriage preparation as only happening in the months and weeks leading up to the wedding day, then yeah, there's a lot of pressure on us to give them everything that we can. But one of the geniuses of the catechumenal process is that it extends beyond the sacrament into a period of what is known as mystagogy. And so you continue to go deeper and deeper in the realities of the mystery that you received on 
the day you received your sacrament, whether it be baptism in one, one hand or in our case, marriage, right? And so we need to be very focused on what we're trying to give the couple um, so that they will then continue to be open to formation into their life uh, with their spouse. We're actually seeing this more. I just had a thought. We're, we're, we're seeing this more and more in the the area of um, raising children. Um, there is a, a Catholic sociologist named Christian Smith, and he's done a ton of work on uh, handing on the faith to children. And the, one of the things that he has seen is that the most important aspect of handing on the faith, uh, to be successful in handing on the faith to children, is not having the best programs or the most up-to-date methodologies. The most important aspect of handing on the faith to children is parents forming a Catholic culture in the home, teaching the children on how to, how to live the faith so that later on, when the actual when it's time to actually learn the content of the faith, the ground has been prepared. And so we need to be working with our couples to create good cultures so that further on, you know, the ins and outs of the theology can be taught, right? All right, so some highlights of the documents. Um, you know, uh, we already mentioned uh, this several times, uh, no need to dwell on it too much, uh, but, you know, the most, the, the thing that we need to begin with is an experience of faith and a personal encounter with Jesus, right? Um, and, and so this, this catechesis that we're going to be bringing our couples through aims to let the mystery of sacramental grace resonate among the spouses, uh, and it seeks to bring them into presence of Christ, uh, uh, not only individually, but together. So again, our, our first focus through this process, this might sound obvious, but this is just hasn't been the approach that we've taken often. I think we just assume it or we look past it. Uh, thinking that it's already there, uh, that the couples have a relationship with Christ, but the process of preparing them for matrimony in and of itself needs to be one in which they encounter the Lord. Um, it is the duty of the entire ecclesial community to elaborate a catechumenal pathway for marriage preparation. And so well, this is one of the things that we've been seeing uh, in, in the order of matrimony, the the book that has the the right of of the of the wedding mass. Um, in the introduction to that book, it says that the preparation for the couple is the is the um, responsibility of the whole ecclesial community, the whole parish. Um, and so in what ways can we call people forth to be able to witness to the truth and goodness of their marriage? Uh, we need to look at that, right? Uh, it's not just a social act. It's, a, it's an ecclesi it's ecclesial act. It's an act of the church. So the church needs to, um, as church and not just as father or um you know, the person that he hires to be the marriage prep coordinator, the whole church needs to take responsibility for this. Um, so uh, certain requirements, of course, um, but uh, again, the most important thing should be this a personal encounter with Christ and the program should be articulated in phases. Um, the, the process of, of baptismal RCIA, OCIA, it, it happens in four phases. We'll go into a little bit of that uh, in a few minutes. But there should be this movement. It, we shouldn't just hand people uh, on the day that they arrive for their marriage preparation a checklist in which they can just, you know, fill in the boxes whenever they need to. We need to be moving them from a place of burgeoning faith into full discipleship with Christ. And so this is the process that we're intending to lead them on. Um, some elements that would be part of that formation, reflection, discussion, dialogue, liturgy, community, prayer, celebration. Um, and then uh, those who accompany couples, whether they be mentors, priests, pastoral workers, should possess a formation and style of accompaniment suited to the catechumenal journey. So again, we want to we want to change from just being teachers or administrators to being uh, those who accompany these couples on their journey. Uh, we want to befriend them and, 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 and journey with them. And so uh, the, the catechumen is not, a, as it says here, is not a preparation for an exam to pass. Like they've got everything checked off. They passed all of their tests. Uh, 
we're preparing them actually to, to live a life. And part of living that life is to be part of a community. Uh, throughout the catechumenal meth uh, method, the, there should be rituals that will divide up those, fa those four phases that mark uh, the completion of one phase and their readiness to move into the next phase. Um, it gives the couple a chance to have like a checkpoint, like, are we where we, we need to be to move on? Um, is marriage still what I what I want? Um, it allows for the ongoing discernment, et cetera. So we want to have checkpoints, right? In which uh, ideally these would be um, rituals that could happen within the community at large. Um, <clears throat> then we have here, it says both for those who already embrace the religious and ecclesial dimensions and for those who lack an experience of faith, it is important that candidates manifest an inner readiness to embark upon a journey of faith conversion as part of the marriage catechumenate. Only when couples have allowed their decision to mature shall they move on to the next stage, so that every man and woman who marry, who marry celebrate the sacrament of matrimony not only validly but also fruitfully. We talk a lot in the church about valid sacraments, but one of the things that we talk about when we talk about like larger sacramental theology in general is what not only makes the sacrament valid you know form and matter but what makes the sacrament fruitful and and that really goes to the the individual's disposition to be able to receive the grace that's offered in that sacrament uh, you can uh you can be confirmed but never go to church is the holy spirit really being fruitful in your life if, if that's the case and so we have to, through this process, help couples to come to a fuller disposition uh, that will enable them to receive the, sac the the grace of matrimony so they can live it fruitfully. Um, no, 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 excuse me. No, nonetheless, there remains a necessary condition for access to the sacrament of ma ma marriage and its val validity. The condition is not a certain a priori minimum level of faith on the part of the betrothed, but rather consists in their intention to do what the church intends to to accomplish in the celebration of marriage between the baptized persons. So again, this kind of goes to like, what is the, is there a deeper level? We're not looking for just the bare minimum. Um, we want couples getting married who are ready to form domestic churches and raise children to pass on the faith. Uh, special attention should be paid to the spiritual method employed during the stage of proximate preparation. During this period of formation and initiation, the transmission of theoretical content should necessarily be accompanied by the invitation to a spiritual journey, which includes experiences of prayer, celebration of the sacraments, spiritual retreats, moments of Eucharistic adoration, missionary experiences, charitable activities, etc. So, it's not just, again, we don't want them to just pass a test and get this head knowledge down. We want to be moving them along the path of discipleship, which will require these moments of encounters in prayer. And so are we building these moments of encounter into our marriage preparation process? Um, and then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the catechumenal pathway of marriage does not end with the celebration of marriage. It goes on. There's a there's a a permanent state now of marriage in which uh, they're going to still be apprenticed into that state uh, by the witness of other um, married couples in the community by the 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 teaching and the accompaniment of the of the wider church etc. Um, so in that state that that what we would call mystagogy the state of after the sacrament. Um, we look at this as apprenticeship, uh, and and we're we're still accompanying the those younger couples uh, in what they've learned and what they will continue to learn. Um, anyone that's been married for more than five minutes uh, knows that uh, just because you celebrated a wedding doesn't mean that you are an expert uh, at living with this person or being a good husband or wife to this person. It takes time to uh, to settle in to learn. Um, to learn not only about them, but about yourself, uh, those areas of maybe your heart that weren't open um, and that the Holy Spirit through the sacrament is working on, right? Um, and so there should still be some post-marriage meetings and and that ideally that uh, uh, a relationship of mentor couples 
would uh, continue past um, the wedding day. So uh, I know that's just a whole lot of information that we're kind of um, shooting at you in kind of fire hose fashion, but uh, just quickly, um, as I mentioned, we've actually been working on this in the Diocese of Lansing uh, probably about five years before the, the Vatican document came out. And, you know, when I heard the Vatican document came out or was coming out, I had two reactions. One was uh, anticipation and, and joy that the church was moving in this direction, but also a little bit of dread, hoping that everything that we had done uh, fit the Vatican's vision, because I really didn't didn't want to have to start from scratch, right? Oh, well, I could tell you that the everything that we had, uh, thanks be to God, the team that we had here working on this uh, really fits in well. And so this is one diocese's way of implementing uh, the marriage catechumenate. So uh, take that for what it is. It might uh, look different in different parts of the country. Uh, so we call it just simply the marriage catechumenate here in the Diocese of Lansing. So this is a kind of a table to show you. Um, on the left side, you'll see the OCIA uh, or formerly the RCIA and those four periods that I mentioned. So the first period is uh, evangelization and the pre-catechumenate. Uh, the second phase is the period of the catechumenate. The third phase is the period of purification and enlightenment. And the fourth phase is the mystagogy. That first phase is really meant to focus on the proclamation of the gospel or maybe you've heard the word uh, kerygma before, the basic gospel message that we were created good, we fell, God sent us a savior, Jesus saved us and, and is inviting us into full union with the Trinity. Um, and so that's really the goal of the first phase of the RCIA is to preach that message. Here in the Diocese of Lansing, very similar. We have some retreats, uh, we have different um, series uh, that people can go to, uh, or multiple sessions, um, but we don't, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is make this very flexible since it is a process and it's something that's focused on accompaniment. We didn't want to nail down a couple has to do these specific things. We wanted to be able to be very flexible so that the pastor who knows the couple best can uh, bend and shape the, the process to better fit the couple. And so for some parishes, uh, a one-day retreat works. Uh, for some couples, they might need to go on a full, you know, if you've heard of the program Alpha. Uh, now, that's very involved, but for some of our parishes, they make it work. And they've had couples that have converted uh, from you know, an evangel one of the one of the um, party was uh, was evangelical, marrying a Catholic. By the end, they converted to Catholicism. So, uh, it, you know, it worked. Um, in the RCIA process, this then gets uh, concluded with the rite of acceptance, uh, and this happens in front of the church at Sunday Mass. Uh, we don't really have anything like that uh, for the marriage catechumenate yet. This is one thing that we've been kind of talking about on a national level of um, hoping maybe that the, the bishops might look at implementing some rituals that we can, uh, some standardized rituals that we can put in place. The second period is the period of, catech of the catechumenate. This is the longest form uh, period of the um, process. This is where they get all of their knowledge, right? And so for us here in Lansing, that means that uh, they're going to get catechetical formation, and that's going to be focused on uh, marriage as a path of discipleship. That might be some theology of the body, or that might be biblical or the catechism of the Catholic Church. What does the church teach about ma marriage? Um, it's also going to have human skills, so life skills like your traditional um, uh, conflict resolution or uh, family of origin things. Uh, NFP, this is where our NFP is taught. Uh, we have a great um, introduction uh, for NFP that we put couples through, and then we invite them to discern which method might be more appropriate for them. And then we have um, uh, different uh, full course methods that are available for them to take. Um, and then any additional formation that the pastor might see, uh, deem that is necessary. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, liturgical formation is also uh, is also a goal. Moving back over to the OCIA, you have the period of purification and enlightenment. We also know that as Lent. Uh, so the, the Lenten process is this more spiritual preparation for the Easter sacraments. It's a time of penance, um, going to confession, uh, increased prayer. 
it's a time of synthesis. They take everything that they've learned, all the, the journey of the encounters that they have been on, and they synthesize that for uh, the preparation for their baptism. Same kind of idea here in um, the marriage catechumenate. We have a retreat that we send our couples to and helps them to synthesize what they've learned and to prepare for their wedding day. And then finally, mystagogy, as we mentioned, is that ongoing training and apprenticeship in the faith. Um, mentioned, so this is not a, uh, a program, it's a process. It's meant to be uh, applied in an accompanying way rather than fitting the couple into a mold, bending the mold to fit the couple. Um, so that flexibility is a feature. Um, we, we've we gotten rid of a standard timeframes. You know, most dioceses have a standard time frame that they ask their couples to complete their process in six, nine, 12 months. We got rid of that. We asked the pastors to help their couples to discern the time that they needed, but also, you know, whether it's at the beginning of the time period or somewhere along the way, have the freedom to say, you're not ready yet and you're going to need some more time. We found a snag that we didn't recognize at the beginning. We got to work that out for your own good. And so not to be so pressured by the time frames, the standards, uh, we left that in the hands of the pastors who, who know their people the best. And then we use a mentoring program called Witness to Love. Uh, and um, not to go too in the weeds, but Witness to Love, they're kind of their thing that it makes them unique is they let the couple pick their own mentors. And they've got um, some psychological studies about attachment theory and things like that, how that actually works better um, uh, for uh couples to be able to, to allow themselves to be mentored if they're attracted to the people that they're that they're uh, being mentored by uh so there's a little bit about witness to love um this is just kind of summarizing what i've already talked about on the formation and the purification and synthesis um but yeah living marriage the mystagogy you know the the goals here continuing that mentoring relationship, incorporating them into the, the larger um, community of families in the parish, and then to get them to participate in marriage enrichment programs that the parish is already running. So just a few words on some important considerations those of you in fertility ministries would have. Um, the character of mentoring is changing. Since such an emphasis is being put on accompaniment, um, uh, programs like Witness to Love and others are looking at how are we getting more people involved in the process of preparing couples for marriage. And so this is going to open up opportunities for you to share the good news of natural methods uh, to couples who might not be familiar with them or might either um, under, under, be under-informed or, mi or completely misinformed about what those methods are. Um, you know, if uh, an engaged couple chooses a, a couple to be their mentor in the parish, and that couple, you know, is is good, faithful, come to mass every day, every Sunday. Um, you know, the, they're an otherwise good couple, but maybe they do, they weren't formed well in um, the church's teaching on fertility, and so now they're their mentor. Um, that is going to expose this already married couple to the teachings of the church. Um, and it might bring them into your uh, circle of influence uh, since they're going to be mentoring the couples that you're going to be working with. And so you might not just be speaking to engaged couples. You might be speaking to already married couples that are their mentors. And this is a wonderful opportunity to pass on the great good of uh, the church's teaching on um, fertility to these married couples, right? Also to remember again, not a program this is a process and so you know the 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 state of family life for the last 50 to 100 years has led us to a place where our couples are not only are they unfamiliar with the moral concerns of con contraception um you know might not have ever even entered into their mind that it might be uh a morally problematic um they might be in a place where they were not only um that malformed, like formed in a in a wrong or a bad way. Uh, they might have had experiences of abuse, um, exposure to things like pornography, and so they have confused ideas about the purposes of sexuality, of intimacy in general, um, what the purpose of marriage is. And so we have to not only be patient with bringing them to a fuller understanding of intimacy and sexuality, we have to be aware of instances where 
we might need to refer them to a Catholic counselor or maybe alerting uh, the pastor that maybe they might need some more time in their preparation um, because uh, they're not, like I said, in times past, we might have just jumped to step two because we could have assumed that they had a good family life growing up or they had a relationship with Christ. But we almost have to go back to step negative one and not assume anything that they that they might have this baggage that they're bringing in. And we need to give some attention to that as well um, so that they can live out uh, their call to marital chastity and to and just to the practicalities of the method that we're trying to teach. And then finally, uh, the gospel is always the message. You're you're never going to merely be an instructor of a method. In one way, shape, or form, you're representing Jesus Christ. You're representing the church. And so you're always going to, part of what you do is going to be helping them to make the connection between uh, their sexual relationship and the gospel. That's always going to be task one. And so uh, this might mean that you need to take a little bit of time and uh, familiarize yourself with the theology of the body or um, the the particularities of humanae vitae. Um, I'm sure, you know, you've, it's not that these things are foreign to you, but you might need to, to delve a little bit deeper into them so that you can then share them as part of your instruction. Um, as you know, a lot of times the marriage preparation process try to teach these things to couples, but you know, the old wisdom, you hear things over and over again it tends to sink in rather than just hear it once one and done and then it's over with and so if you are also able to share the the good news of humana vitae theology of the body etc but then also make the connection with the practicalities of the method you're teaching uh, with uh those gospel elements that'll help the couple to be able to integrate that better into the their lived life of their of their marriage so with that, I guess we'll just open it up to if there's any questions or uh, any conversation. Yes, I, I thank you so much, Richard. I, I have lots of questions. Um, uh, uh, let me group them into um, maybe categories. Um, so first, beginning with people. Um, I like how in the program, you're realistic. You're mm -hmm. looking at where people are coming from, their home environments at this mm -hmm. point in time, and what could possibly be out there. Um, it's no longer um, safe to say that every child, every young adult is going to experience a happy family life. Um, uh, and certainly, if the majority of our couples uh, are having divorces and children are being raised in a one-parent home, uh, there's a wound there that mm -hmm. is always going to have to be acknowledged. On top of that, for the, the world of fertility and human sexuality, we know that our culture is um, pretty much uh, toxic with, mm -hmm. with regard to really negative, false messages about human sexuality, the meaning and the nature of it all. And sadly, I think our medical profession has mm. been greatly oh, absolutely. misguided. Absolutely. Too, right? Yeah, so parents are, are being told to give their, their young girls, for example, on uh, hormonal contraception, mm -hmm. when that, that is the worst possible thing you could do for their developing bodies, mm -hmm. let alone their developing social you know, skills and understanding of how they should relate uh, to young men as they're growing up. Uh, and our schools, of course, our public school systems uh, often have sex education and other health type of programs that are called help, but they're not value free. Uh, they tend to treat human sexuality as uh, a, a mechanical function Excellent. that people should understand and uh, let's fix it by using contraception effectively. Uh, so these things are all out there that people um, without even realizing it are, are swimming in this, this, uh, this pollution of uh, false messages about the human person, about human sexuality, about relationships, male-female relationships, and um, uh, what God really intended for all of us. It, it really is a, a terrible mess. And mm -hmm. certainly adding the level of social media and the um, oh, yeah. access 
right? To, mm -hmm. to information and to listening to false prophets um, is, is staggering. Um, so trying to find out who the person is who's coming for marriage preparation or who the child is or the teenager or the young adult in any of our um, catechetical programs, uh, in any of our formation programs, that's, that's part of what needs to be done um, so that you can bring Jesus to that person. And, and I was thinking as you were talking that how many of them really do have that vibrant relationship with Christ that that is so needed. And this is part of the, I think, the key message of the current pontificate with Pope Francis. He wants Catholics to reclaim their relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. No matter how stylized our sacraments have become or how sophisticated our theology is, keeping that mystery of the person of Christ and that personal relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. um, front and center. That's what all of this is geared for. And, and I find that to be so exciting about the program, uh, the program, the process, not the program, the process that you all put together in your diocese, um, but meeting the people where they're at and, 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 and beginning with the mystery of, of them as beloved children of God, trying to introduce them to Christ through the marriage preparation um, process uh, and, and finding different ways before you even get to that proximate time, but the remote ways of doing that. It, it's a lovely organic approach uh, to, um, to, to healing, to bringing uh -huh. healing and formation. And I, I think that natural family planning easily fits into all of that. Oh, yeah. because it's, it's an ethical skill set, obviously, uh -huh. for married couples. And certainly the fertility information at younger ages, um, I think of programs like Dr. Hannah Klaus's uh, Teen Star, oh, yeah. which was uh, pioneering in, in helping uh, teenagers understand the meaning of their fertility. And, and, and it is all geared to creating family. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it's all geared to. It, it, it's not something that we should uh, be afraid of or we should deny. Um, because again, that has to do with the future and that has to do with our children and, and our family life. So yeah, so I could see how all of these things can fit together. Um, and again, I applaud uh, your team and certainly your bishop for, for looking at this so carefully and, and bringing back um, the um, real presence of Jesus himself into this process which there's nothing better than seeing that light go on in a person's eyes about, um, yeah, he's real. He's not just a name on paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we've had some great, we've had some great stories come to us from the parishes about how people who probably before would have just kind of went through the check marks and then, you know, on their wedding day wouldn't have been that much different than the day that they first showed up at the parish, right? Um, but because of this process, they found Christ. Um, we've had uh, situations where, you know, uh, um, that mentor couple, uh, we had uh, one situation where in which the uh, the pastor came to me and he was like, um, they chose a mentor couple, but I'm aware of the situation where the husband does, doesn't want to use contraception, but the wife has an IUD. What do I do? And I said, let them be mentors, but it asked them to go to all the, through all the steps that the, the marriage couple or the, the engaged couple is going through so that they can hear the message that's being proclaimed. And by the wedding, the wife had her IUD removed. And if my memory serves, I think that they decided to have more children at that point. Like, so she was, I think, I think pregnant by the time the wedding happened. So, um, and so, yeah, like that, that, that message that I kind of ended with is like, uh, that to just be aware that other people might start to come into that, that circle of influence and that we might not just be speaking to the engaged couple. Right. Um, and that brings me to, um, more the technical side of things, how all of this, um, was put together, how all of this. Um, uh, the map 
you know, was developed for um, uh, for this lovely process. Um, so, for example, I usually say to diocesan uh, natural family planning coordinators, leaders, teachers, uh, the church is only offering natural family planning because of our teachings on marriage and family life and how uh, the nature of, of human sexuality, et cetera. Um, that means that when the church offers NFP services, as what you were pointing out, church teaching, it, its key um, elements of truth need to be integrated into mm -hmm. those methodology, very practical science kind of classes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people will need to know why they have to go through that effort of um, uh, actually changing their behavior in order to work with their fertility and, um, and, and, and honor God's plan for their married lives. Um, so for when you're taking something as grand as this process, um, I'd like to know um, how did it, how did, um, how did you all go about it? Was it your, your idea? Did you have a few leaders in your office? Were there a few priests? out there in the in the diocese or did the bishop say no we're, we're, people are checking the box a little bit too much around mm -hmm. here we've, we've got to do something to really hit them hard with good solid seeds of evangelization i'd like to know more about how that process um was created and also how did it if at all connect to other things already going on like catholic grammar schools um ocia programs happening in the parishes um did you have to bring in parish leaders and train them or orient them? You know, what what's the nothing? Sure, sure. Yeah. Simply. So Bishop's goal was just that um, families could be formed as domestic churches. And so uh, one of the first things I did, because when I came to the diocese, we had a marriage and family office that was more or less defunct. Uh, it didn't have a full-time director for... I think um, maybe five or six years. Um, the the task of scheduling retreats for marriage preparation was just kind of attached to another office. Um, and so, you know, the first day when I was hired, he said, make our families domestic churches. And so um, I formed an advisory committee of various marriage and family leaders around the diocese. And I said, okay, I we basically have two ways of doing this. We can really lean in to like our schools and our youth programs and really form people, uh, young people, so that when they're getting married, they, they're, they're well-formed. Or we can focus on the marriage preparation process itself. And at the end of the day, we realized, you know, um, children are mostly informed by their parents. And you can have the best programs, you can have the best catechetical leaders, but if it isn't being supported in the home, it's not going to stick as well. And so we really leaned in to forming um, these adults who are getting getting married. And so then the process, we knew that we, you know, that John Paul II had been calling for this way back. Pope Francis, at that point, it was 2016. Uh, we were in the midst of the, uh, uh, the synods on the family. Pope Francis was pretty regularly talking about... Um, marriage preparation as a catechumenate. So we knew, we, we had a pretty strong feeling this is the direction we're going in anyways. And so we just decided to cash in all our chips for a marriage catechumenate. And so we went around the diocese, we held town hall meetings all over. Um, and anybody that was involved in marriage preparation was invited to come to those meetings. And so uh, NFP teachers, um, other instructors of you know the various programs that we have in pastors, deacons, et cetera. And we did a quick uh, explanation of the RCIA process. I was lucky that I have been an RCIA teacher for about 15 years, and so I'm very familiar with the process. Uh, and so I was able to give a, a summary of it. And then we just asked them to work in table groups and just brainstorm and dream, like how could marriage preparation fulfill this phase of the marriage preparation process and you know you get a lot of info from those things and you got to kind of sift through it and find the diamonds in the rough i mean one of the things that came out of that was getting rid of the standard time frame of marriage preparation um, because we you, we really saw that if we were gonna 
accompany these people and we we're going to make a process that help, that was for the couple rather than fitting them into what we needed um it was going to require different amounts of time for different people um and so we uh we really leaned into uh getting rid of that i took a little bit of convincing of some some key people in the diocese but we we did it um and so then just working with uh the the information we got from those town hall meetings uh some small group uh small um t uh tasks um task forces within the advisory committee we slowly put this thing together and then um we chose i think beginning in the fall of 2018 we we chose 10 parishes in the diocese to pilot it and we walked hand in hand with them as they kind of were going through trying to understand this and we were trying to understand it and um and we we did a we did a 18 month pilot phase because we wanted to have a good sample size and so um you know most couples are getting married between 9 and 12 months um, so we figured if it was 18 months, we could get a good cycle of maybe two cycles of couples going through. Um, that 18 month period ended in March of 2020. And so right when the world was falling apart, we had our, uh, our final, uh, pilot meeting, uh, on, on zoom in the early days, uh, and, and, and got the feedback that we needed from the parishes and then, went through the process of, you know, every diocesan change has to go through the presbyteral council and, you know, and all that, that lovely bureaucracy. Um, but by the fall of 2020, it was the standard throughout the diocese. And so really at this point, uh, we're in a, a process of refinement, um, accompanying the parishes, you know, just kind of follow up with the parishes that are maybe still not completely on board or um, maybe unclear on some steps and things like that. You know, part of this is it, it does require more attention to the individual couples than just handing them a checklist and tell, and, and giving them a schedule of when various classes are. Um, and so for some parishes, that's a challenge because maybe they have low staff. Um, and so part of that's been hey why don't you work with the nearby parish and you guys can share uh scheduling and, and responsibilities and, and things like that so just figuring out those problems and... and and i have to say that also sounds like an awful lot of attention that you and any of your staff have to give to the parishes yeah mm -hmm. which is huge and and i know that 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 particular aspect of it might be intimidating to some dioceses that don't have, uh, or maybe have too many ministries folded into one person's position in the chancery. Um, yeah, well, as and, and before we hit record, you know, we were talking a little bit, and and I said, uh, you know, we decided to really focus on the essentials because if we get marriage preparation right, we'll have couples that are forming domestic churches, and a lot of the problems that go further down the 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 conveyor belt will be easier to deal with because people are growing up in healthy families and so part of it was just like let's go to the root of the problem uh, root of the problems that we see and then uh, get after that and then um, as we're able to we can start to bring other things into the mix right yeah uh, it 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 is remarkably creative and may i say holy spirit filled yeah oh <laughs> anyway, yeah. no it, it just is uh Sadly, there are still um, um, too many dioceses out there in the country that um, have the checklist approach to marriage preparation. Um, and sadly, natural family planning in that picture often means uh, a brochure mm -hmm. that either a deacon or a priest gives them with a little bit of a, a talk about uh, church teaching um, or maybe in uh, a group setting, right? in a typical um, Saturday morning to the afternoon marriage preparation session, there might be a 30 minute talk about natural family planning and church teaching on marital love and, and uh, responsible parenthood. And, and then again, like I said, the handouts given and nobody's thinking of anything else. Um, so so it, it, it is it, that approach, it may have been novel in the 1970s or the 1980s, 
um, because marriage preparation, as you said, uh, as a, a ministry in the church has been something that's been growing over time. But this um, gutsy approach of the apprenticeship mm -hmm. and, uh, and what it takes to accompany both the, the, the clergy and parish leaders of the couples who come to them um, for this sacrament, and then the chancery staff to their parish leaders. Mm -hmm. there, there is, um, it's much more of a lifeline. And I think that um, you, you've got a, a terrific model that I hope you'll share. With oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> we're not we're not copywriting anything. Anybody yes. can. <laughs> well, I, you know, I we could talk after this recording, <laughs> but I do think you should publish some type of workbook about this process. We, we do have a book that we have available uh, on our uh on our website that people can go ahead and download the oh, first good. half of it. The first half of it gives the logic of what we're trying to do. And then the second half is the practical, what we're trying to do in the diocese. Now that the, again, we wrote that in 2017. I wrote it when in the weeks after my son was born and I had a little bit of paternity leave. And so I was, you know, when my wife was napping, I was on the computer typing this thing up. Um, and so, but so it needs a little bit of updating, especially with the document of catechumenal pathways. It would be important to implement or integrate that document into what we have. But uh, yeah, if people want that, I can give them a link. You know, we can we can help uh, share the information. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I'm sure they will. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, I see Gabriella that you're you're with us. Do you have any questions? Hello, friends. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. I was a couple minutes late, so I didn't want to distract your presentation <laughs> by turning on my camera. Oh, you're fine. Um, I don't think I have any specific questions. I'm just excited that we're talking about this. I was happy to see the topic of marriage catechumenate, and I just, I resonated with some of the things that you were talking about, Richard, um, and you as well, Teresa, just um, about having it be a process about having Christ at the center, um, about NFP reaching not only the engaged couples, but also the mentor couples or you know families in the parish that never heard this message and are now in a mentoring role um, to have them be formed alongside the engaged couples. I think that's so important um, to have NFP teachers be better versed in theology of the body and humanity vitae, also important um, to have young people encountering the truth of theology of the body and natural methods as part of Catholic school curriculum, having that be integrated with, with health classes, religion classes, whatever. Yeah, we've actually been working a lot with our Office of Catholic Schools to integrate theology of the body. Uh, we're working at, on different programs that we can do to, to help mothers and daughters have Other those daughter. conversations, yeah. or conversations, et cetera, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Where right, are you from, outside Gabriel? of the walls of the schools. Yeah. Where are you from? I am in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, home of the wow. National Eucharistic yeah. Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure things are crazy there right now. Yeah, it's been an interesting timing of like marriage catechumenate, but we're having the Eucharistic revival. <laughs> so I think the Lord is um, helping me to do some reflecting on what marriage catechumenate is going to okay. look like and yeah. planting some seeds. Great. And then hopefully when we are just revived by our encounter with the Eucharist, then that will flow into our marriage and family That's life, right, right, maybe right. like a year and a half later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like, Gabriella, you're, you're, getting, you're getting a flood of graces. Uh, amen. Amen. That's that's the prayer. Um, so yeah, I've been been inspired watching from a distance what what you've been doing uh, up north of us, um, and I'm excited to uh, to see how it rolls out. Well, feel free to give us a call anytime, and we can have a uh, more in depth chat. I would love that. Cool. Well, thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Richard. Um, this was highly informative and truly inspiring. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless. Thank you. Good to see you.